a break, uh, not for my sake, but anyhow, I'll, sh I'll share it with you later. All right. But something for, for looking forward to spring, you know, yeah. flower, in a word, flower. Just want to ask everybody flower. to mute themselves. And if you don't mute yourself, I will mute you. But it just makes it easier to hear Dana. Yeah. But if you want to disagree strongly, you can always unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. And that does bring up. So for one thing, thank you so much for joining it. It certainly livens up my week to, to have something like this to, to work on. I had two weeks to work on this one <laughs> because I was ready to go. But I got up uh, last Wednesday morning at about six and that, there was no electricity in the house. I'm off grid solar, been off grid solar for 20 years and not had much problem. That was the worst problem was last Wednesday morning. No electricity. I have a generator. I turned the generator on and it would not wake up the batteries. It wouldn't go into the system. It ran, but it wouldn't go into the system. Anyhow, uh, you know, I've mentioned that, you know, fly in the ointment phenomenon. So that was a fly in the ointment. <clears throat> so uh, we want to uh, move through uh some sort of summation of this journey this you know i think is it, user friendly name is big history it's you know a slightly more complex way to identify it as the evolutionary journey of the universe and apparently it's been on a journey and this little picture indicates that there's movement and things have changed over time and that's the big history story um this one we get to we get to our species homo sapiens in the last four or five slides and i found that somewhat challenging to, um as denny and i laughed about a minute ago you know what are you going to say about homo sapiens <laughs> you know? uh that isn't uh <clears throat> it won't offend everybody or isn't too controversial as we uh, try and make our way <clears throat> in the world but the point of this story is that we're part of something much larger. We're part of a journey, an enormous journey. I don't think it's fully uh, possible to understand it, but we can, we can get out of our own drama enough to recognize that we're part of something enormous and special. Um, I think I, <clears throat> I had a note. I don't know where I put it. I wanted to bring up, uh, and I've mentioned this before. So in, in the program like this, you get a certain amount of information and a lot of it is science-based. Hopefully it's accurate, you know, but even science itself is, can be <clears throat> challenged uh, because it's conducted by humans and humans are always have self-interest involved. Anyhow, um, the point of information and how much information can we absorb and what does it do for us, an example, came to mind for me that has always been very humorous. And that is that my father had a book on his bookshelf that he wanted to read for a number of years. And he finally took it off the shelf and opened it to read it. And it was all marked up with a yellow marker. And he was so upset that somebody had marked up his book. And then he realized that he had read the book the year before and forgot all about it. <laughs> And that, I think that shows the power of information. We can't remember, you know, we cannot remember all this information. I can hardly remember what I talked about in the first program of these four. But what we can do is just save a little space outside of the, our personal drama for observing the world around us and being aware that we're part of something special. And I think that's what I wanted to say about that. So a couple of review items. We're talking about evolution in this uh, structure that the big history people have put together. And I think it's a good one. It's, uh, I don't think it should be taken as gospel by any sense, but uh, it's a worthy outline to, in a way to think about the journey of the universe. So they come up with these eight thresholds and um, themes. So these are, these are their eight thresholds. And then the, down at the bottom, I opt, I changed them a little bit. I mentioned that, but you cannot argue with the fact that, well, you can argue with the fact that whether there was a big bang, I don't think it's a hundred percent agreed 
And whatever the Big Bang was, there's no way for our minds to understand it. But the universe, it does appear to be expanding. And if you wound it backwards, it would all be in the same place. And that's the evidence for a Big Bang. And that is clearly a threshold. If there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there's almost everything, that's some kind of a threshold in the journey of the universe. There were no stars. There were no stars. I had to, I looked it up. You can find all this information now quite easily online. When did the first stars ignite? I asked Google. Google said 200 million years after the Big Bang. We've talked a little bit about stars. Stars required gravity, the presence of gravity, which appeared very quickly. You'd think gravity would be there right away, but I, in reading about it, it might not have been at the moment of the Big Bang, but soon after gravity. There was hydrogen, there was helium. Gravity started to pull the hydrogen together. The more hydrogen pulled together, the more powerful the gravity got because the more mass there was in one place. And that's what created stars. After 200 million years of pulling hydrogen together, they smashed into one another. They started fusing. It's a fusion reaction. And hydrogen fuses into helium. So you still have matter, but you have a little less matter. And what the missing matter turned into energy. And that's how stars create energy. Elements, there was only hydrogen and helium. Now there's 92 naturally occurring elements and 100, I mean, 10 plus 16 maybe made by humans. But the, uh, the other 90 that did not exist that are naturally occurring were created in stars or in supernovae explosions. You can't have planets. You can't make a planet, not much of a planet out of hydrogen helium. It's gonna be a gas planet. That might be, I don't know, Jupiter may be mostly hydrogen helium. It's a gas planet. You had to have this process of stars forming. The universe has been building on itself. Stars formed, elements formed, then planets can form. You know, it's arguable whether you could have life before you had a place to stand, <laughs> a planet, a solid planet. We don't know of any other life in the universe except on Earth. And the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. The, uni the universe is 14 billion. So there was a journey, life appeared uh, David Christian and the big history people then list humans. It's reasonable humans have a, a major, major, they're a major threshold in the journey of life on the planet. But I put in photosynthesis because humans would have nothing to eat if it weren't for photosynthesis. Then they have agriculture. Agriculture is a huge change in the impact on the planet and in humanity. I think abstract thought in the various ways that we use it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, as I like to say, intelligence and ecology, I think we're still waiting for those to appear. Anyhow, these thresholds to review, this is also a review that there was no life, then there was early life in the form of prokaryotes, small cells, they're different than our cells, uh, bacteria and archaea. They've split those two prokaryotic type organisms, tiny cells, some of them are a hundred times smaller than the cells that make up our bodies, which are called eukaryotic cells. Our cells are full of organelles like mitochondria and nucleus and ribosomes and such. Prokaryotes don't have those. They're much simpler, but they're functional. And then the kingdoms of life that we're more familiar with, fungi, plants, animals, they all appeared over time. They're multi-celled organisms. There were no multi-celled organisms. All this had to figure out uh, by trial and error, by natural selection, how these larger life forms could appear. This is a timeline of actually what I just was talking about, about the journey of life. So at the far left, 4.5 billion years is the formation of the earth, solidifies 4 billion into solid rocks because of the elements made previously in stars and, and supernova explosions. So life appeared and really humans try to explain it. They, they have it on this, it is about 3.8 billion years ago is the first evidence of bacterial life. It's just a chemical trail left in rocks in Greenland to tell you the truth at 3.8 billion years. But those stromatolites that we talked about last week, those rocky mounds in shallow water in the ocean which still exist appeared by 3.5 billion years ago. Those are bacterial but they're photosynthetic, which means they're capturing the energy of the sun and using it to split water, take the hydrogen from the water, attach it to carbon dioxide, and magically, I wish I had my magic wand, 
you get sugar. And that's the basis of all other life. And so life goes on. The multicellular life cannot exist without the high levels of oxygen that we have in the atmosphere now. Oxygen is released by photosynthesis. So prior to photosynthesis, no, no oxygen. I've said several times, oxygen is highly reactive. It would not last in the atmosphere very long if it were not constantly pumped into the atmosphere by photosynthetic organisms. In fact, it drops slightly in the winter because uh, I think I've seen a graph and I think it's less than 1%, but it does drop slightly because photosynthetic plants are not functional or photosynthetic organisms are not functional in the winter. I mean, it was 12 degrees at my house this morning and water's frozen and the plants can't function. No photosynthesis in the Northern hemisphere. So you can't have, you can't have multicellular organisms without oxygen because, you know, I mentioned the, the, the point that we breathe and we, we actually, we often, we don't know why we breathe. We breathe for oxygen. What does the oxygen do? Well, and you can, then you can read, well, oxygen supplies the energy. Well, oxygen does not supply energy. Oxygen breaks that hydrocarbon bond made by photosynthesis, pulls the hydrogen away, and in the process, still a bit of a mystery, energy is released because the electrons move in those shells we talked about last week or the week before, two weeks or three weeks ago. You know, ultimately it's uh, quantum physics and difficult for us to understand, but that's what's going on when we take oxygen in it goes into our cells. Now, is there any more? Ah, uh, yes, land plants. Land plants, there were, there were no plants, on, there was no life on land for much of the history of the earth. We talked a little bit about the fact there's actually more land than there used to be because continental rock is different than ocean crust. It's higher in silica. It actually, it's less dense, rides high on the ocean crust and becomes terrestrial land, but there was no life on it. Land plants appeared about 450 million years ago they're multicellular. You can't have multicellular organisms without this high oxygen level. So life has built on previous uh, advances in complexity over time. So we're going to just talk briefly then about plants because we want to talk about the evolutionary journey, but we only have an hour to do it. So we only have, I think I have three slides on the plant kingdom and I left out fungi completely. And I left protists out, which are eukaryotic cells, but they tend to be single-celled organisms. If you looked into a drop of water, you might see things swimming around in there, single-celled organisms with a magnify, uh, microscope. They'd be protists. They're very, if I got a drop of river water, there would be protists in it. The plant kingdom. The plant kingdom appeared about 400 million years ago. Very simple organisms at first and have complexified since then. And, you know, on a journey, and in fact, I, I do show the journey in the next slide, but here we have uh, lower left conifers, upper right fer, uh, ferns. They have different, always have different ways of reproducing. Flowering plants are the most recently evolved of the family groups, which are divided into groups called divisions or phyla. That's obviously a columbine. Uh, and, and, Darwin called flowering plants the abominable mystery because they are the last group of plants to emerge, but they took over the planet in terms of numbers. There are about 300,000 flowering plants and there are like 600 conifers and maybe 10,000 ferns, but nothing like flowering plants. But in terms of weight, biomass, flowering plants and conifers are roughly equal. So. It's not as if one group of plants disappears or is relegated to the back. It's just the world has filled up with the diversity of life. So this is complicated at first and we're not gonna look at the whole thing, but I circled here. These are the plant divisions, which could be called phyla. In, in the animal kingdom, they're called phyla. Plants they tend to call them divisions. And you, we recognize some of those names in that first column algae i mentioned algae is green algae is now often put in the plant kingdom it wasn't previously i mean up to about 15 years ago 
but because evolutionarily, structurally, in terms of its DNA, it's so similar to plants that it's now thought that plants evolved from certain kinds of green algae. Um, liverworts, you probably know, you probably know what those are, hornworts, you probably don't know what hornworts are. I've never seen a hornwort. So then I'm gonna pull up another circle or ellipse here. These are the number of species in the world and in the methow. If you go across with hornworts, there's only a hundred hornworts in the whole world and none have ever been seen in the methow. It's just interesting to realize that the methow is a laboratory of evolution, that all the, the whole story of evolution is present in the methow valley, whatever group of organisms you're looking at. So if we, and some of these numbers we know and some of the numbers we don't know, but mosses, you know, the uh, fourth one down, we all know what mosses are. There's 26,000 mosses in, in, on the planet. That's surprising that they're so diverse. And there's probably about 250 in Met Howe and 200 been identified by passing bryologists. That's what you call a person who studies mosses and they leave us lists. There's no professional bryologist in the valley that I'm aware of. So these numbers are interesting. Club mosses, I think some of you would not know what a club moss is. They're not so present. There's a picture of one coming up. Horsetails are interesting because that this, I made this at least 15 years ago, this chart. It should be a little, I think I turned it into a PDF, so I can't change it. Horsetails, it says 40. They've done DNA analysis since I made this, and that number went down to 18. There's only 18 species of horsetails on the whole planet. They just realized that, you know, that they look different, but they were the same species. Fern cycads. Oh, so cycad. What's a cycad? I don't know if you can, you can probably see me there. I brought my cycad. Looks like a fern, but it's not a fern. This is a cycad. There's, I know there's, a, they grow mostly in the tropics. They're, they're native in Florida. They need moisture. Uh, but this plant has done great. I ordered it by mail and it's been a lot of fun. No cycads in the methow. Conifers, just interesting to see. So 14 conifers, we'd all be hard pressed to name those 14 conifer trees that are in the methow valley flowering plants. So this is the journey, but this is almost, this is a range in evolutionary order. Plants appeared in, more or less in this order. And complexified and diversified over time, such that there are now 300,000 flowering plants, even though they're the youngest of these plant divisions. This is a picture of methouse soil. This is actually at my house. This is about 50 yards from where I'm sitting, although it's covered with snow. But what I'm saying is how rocky, you know, those are, those are glacial cobbles. Those are water rounded cobbles left by the glacier when it melted 13,000 years ago, covered with lichen, which are not plants. Uh, and then the green is a club moss. And that's why I put this picture in here because this oh, tremendously rugged ground in the methow is often covered with this club moss. There's also a, the darker plant is a moss, which is a different plant division, club moss. So this, uh, we have a, I forget, let's look. Club moss, eight species in the methow. This is one of the eight species. I actually can't remember the name of it. But the interesting thing about club mosses is, is things change over time. And in the old days, so that's, this is that, sliced out club moss, as we can see, there's 1,200 species, eight in the methow. The thing about club mosses is in the old days, they were 130 feet tall and a foot and a half in diameter. And the majority of the coal deposits that we so vigorously dig up in Wyoming and elsewhere are made out of these 100 foot tall club moss plants that no longer exist on the planet. Now they shrunk down. The tallest club mosses are two feet tall this species here is two inches tall. Things change over time. And they had to, they were probably overtopped by conifers. That's probably what happened. Outcompeted and shrank down into a habitat that they could live in. This is a similar graph for vertebrates in the world and in the methow. It goes in the other direction. Uh, these, the, the plant groups, uh, uh, I guess this is all one phyla. These are all vertebrates. 
All these animals have backbones, obviously. Uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. And then those are classes. Fish is a class within the phylum of chordates, backbones. So how many in the world? A lot of fish. Not too many fish in the Medhow. Not very many at all, 26 amphibians. So the thing is, again, this is, as with plants, this is an evolutionary journey. You can almost see it going across the top there. Amphibians, the word amphibian means two lives. Amphibians are born in water and come out of the water as adults. They have gills as juveniles and lungs as adults. It's an amazing transformation, it's a metamorphosis, like a butterfly. Uh, but they have to return to water to lay their eggs. So we only have seven species of amphibians in the Methow because it's so dry here, because it's so arid. And the river doesn't work very well for amphibians because the water's so cold. It needs to warm up enough for them to develop. So all this information, everything, even what I have said in the last 10 minutes about the evolutionary journey of life is all new information. I mean, uh, Aristotle thought that swallows came out of the pond in the spring because one day there were no swallows and the next day there were swallows. And he thought they just came out of the pond and they didn't know about migration. We everything we know about the world, we've had to learn. And, and it's an admirable and honorable journey that Homo sapiens has been on, whatever our failings we could say. And this is an example of how hard it has been to learn about life because we don't know and we're looking into things. So in the 1600s, the first magnifying glasses were invented. And this guy, Nicholas Hartsoker, um, looked at human sperm. And what he saw in the human sperm were human. He preformed humans in the sperm. Uh, and there's a picture of him here lined up in a needle of a needle. I think that's more of a joke. But he was quite serious. Uh, they called it preformation. And, and, and this survived at least as long as he survived, you know, for the 50 years that he um, popularized this view that humans li lived as preformed little tiny humans in sperm and, and were then transferred to the female who would take care of that preformed human who came solely from the male, which also addresses, it brings up that problem of the self-center in science, and it comes up constantly. I just reread uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bryson, which once again, I recommend. And people repeatedly would claim scientific invention, scientific advances, scientific insights that they stole from somebody else <laughs> because they wanted the glory. They would get Nobel Prizes and they did not even make the discovery, but they were satisfied with the lie. That's so fascinating to me. So my point is that it's been a, a, a two steps forward, one step back to make these scientific advances. And we should not assume that we know everything now. Uh, there's a lot of holes in our views of the world and a lot of blank places. So where humans really come from in terms of the scientific story is of course emerging of a sperm and an egg into one cell. And that one cell then somehow stunningly has all the information that that organism as a single cell, all the information it needs to grow into adulthood, survive and reproduce. This is a picture of a human embryo at I think two weeks. And the interesting thing is here, the human embryo has a tail, it has gill slits, and it has a yolk sac because, well, this is a cute little, we need to embrace our inner fish because our bodies are, are um, evolutionarily, we, we revisit the evolutionary journey as embryos. And there's a little saying coming up down here at the bottom. I debated whether to leave it in, but the, I'll explain it. It says ontogeny reco recapitulates phylogeny. That means the development of the individual, ontogeny, the, the physical development reco recapitulates the journey of the phylum or the class. 
that it has to go through all that. Um, we came up, we came up with a saying that's a joke, and I don't think you'll get it, but I'm going to say it, and that is that uh, phylogeny. So the word, so this this says ontogeny. There's a word that means mountain building called orogeny. And we came up with, uh, in The Naturalist, somebody who writes for The Naturalist came up with uh, orogeny, um, um, phylogeny, which is the evolution of groups of ag animals. Phylogeny recapitulates orogeny because, because the evolutionary journey of life mirrors the landforms where these organisms <laughs> live. So in a way, we're a reflection of the land we live on. This is a somewhat more complicated image of embryos. So what we have here lined up at the top, one week old embryos, two week old embryos, three week old embryos, and what those embryos are down at the bottom, fish, salamander, chick, hog. The point here is all the embryos look the same in the first week. So here's human embryo. I circled it over up there on the right. It's no different than the other ones. It has to differentiate because of the DNA message, you know, the micro, in infinitely small DNA. What have I read? If you, all the DNA and humanity in the world could fit in a thimble, somehow all that information is there for the development. But if things had gone wrong, you could have ended up a hog or a tortoise or a salamander because you started out the same. It was just Small variations, small variations. I've mentioned before, we have, well, I forget the actual number. It could, is it 50% the same DNA as a banana? <laughs> All life is related. And that's not a small insight. Those are our relatives out there. So this is a mud skipper, it's a fish. There are a number of mud skipper species. They come, they, they're able, their lobe fin, they have a strong enough structure in their front fins that they can support themselves on them. And they, they come out of the water. And they come out of the water, probably. Why do they come out of the water? Probably to avoid predators. And it turns out, and, and to find mates. I mean, it's an agreed upon place that if you want to find a mate, if you're a mudskipper, come out on land because uh, it's probably a more limited habitat than swimming around. And it's safer. There were no predators when this evolutionary behavior evolved. Turns out that mudskippers spend up to 75% of their time on land and they can absorb oxygen through the, the mucus lining of their mouth and throat. They don't have lungs, but they can still absorb oxygen and spend time out of the water. It just shows the evolutionary journey and how this evolutionary journey occurred. It's not a very big step to get to the salamanders that we have in the Meadha Valley, which again, uh, just reflect the life in the Medhow reflects the whole evolutionary journey on the entire planet. So we have, I think we only have two species of salamanders, this long toed and tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders are amphibians, two lives. As adults, they, they're on land. They're hard to find because they need to be in damp places. So they're actually in gopher holes a lot, but you can find them on occasion. I'm sure many of you have run into these, but they, but to, but to read, um, reproduce, they have to go back to liquid water and lay their eggs in water. Amphibians are still tied to the water. They never get very far from the land. It's an evolutionary journey. It took life a long time to learn how to live on land because it's so desiccating. It's so dry. It's not unimaginable that over time, Amphibians such as the salamander could turn into a reptile. Sorry, Olga, about the snake. Olga doesn't like snakes, but this one will not come out of the picture. Um, the thing about reptiles is they evolved over time an egg with a semi-permeable membrane that retains the moisture, which is the water, so it doesn't dry out, but can breathe. It can still access the oxygen in the atmosphere because the organism inside is alive and it needs needs to be in touch with the larger ecosystem. So reptiles lay their eggs on land and it opened up the settlement of land to the animal kingdom. Reptiles were the first that did not have to, of, of the vertebrates, insects preceded them with a different history, uh, of course, yeah. But uh, so 
again, the point is there's this journey, this journey that we can see unfolding that we're both a part of and that we can see all around us in the Met, how this evolutionary journey is imprinted on the life all around us. Now there is a, you know, some of the reptiles, turtles are reptiles and they go back to, they go back to the water, but they come out of the water to lay their eggs. I can't think of any reptile that lays its eggs in water. So this is Archaeopteryx. We've all seen this picture or a similar picture. This was found in 1861. This was found two years after Darwin published uh, on, on the origin of species, which he was very hesitant to publish because the major dominant concept in the human mind, certainly the Western mind at that time was that the earth was 6,000 years old and had be create, been created in a few days by a God. And if species evolved, Darwin needed millions of years. I forget what he said in the first edition. That book went through many, many editions. It was very popular. I know he, he was afraid nobody would buy it. They, they published 1,200 copies and it sold out on the first day <laughs> back in 1859. So he had multiple editions and anyhow, the earth needed to be old. And that was, it was threatening because we take our concepts so seriously. We take our identity, the concepts that give us our sense of who we are are so serious that the religious community was outraged, was outraged. So one question was, well, where are the intermediate? Uh, how do you get, how, how could these creatures have evolved? How, you know, how could birds have evolved from reptiles? That's ridiculous. And then two years later, in 1861, this arche first Archaeopteryx was found. They found a number of more since, six or 12, I forget which. It's intermediate. It has feathers. You can see the outline of the feathers in that fossil. But it has teeth. Birds don't have teeth. It had sharp teeth. It was a carnivore. It had claws and a long tail. Um, characteristics of reptiles that birds don't have. And so the evidence and the evidence has grown far more convincing since this 1861 find. So birds evolve from reptiles. These are some of our 280 bird species in the Methow. Uh, surprisingly many, although some of those, 20 or 30, have only been seen once or twice or three times, but birds have wings, so birds show up in strange places, and we have people now who are finding these unusual species, um, not these species, <laughs> they're not so unusual. I want to mention, so these are, you know, beautiful creatures that we have that evolved, part of the evolutionary journey we have before us in the Met How. The, well, the bottom right, I put up a tub for geese because Canada geese nest in tubs in the Met How. I've never seen a goose nest on the ground in the Met How. There are a lot of tubs up and I don't know if they all nest in tubs, but I have this tub up and the first year I got a great horned owl in it. That was about 15 years ago, ever since I've had geese in it. The bald eagle on the left, I was walking near here out in the floodplain. This bald eagle was stuck. He had his foot caught in a, the V of a branch. He was hanging upside down. If he could have got back up, he could have got his foot out, but he was hanging upside down and flapping when I came by because it scared him. So I called Kent and Kent called the smoke jumpers and the smoke jumpers came and it took about two hours, but they climbed up that tree and they sawed that limb down. <laughs> And as the bird fell, it got free and it flew away. I remember I was there, but that's just was a strange event to see a big, beautiful adult bald eagle that had got itself caught in a tree. And, you know, if it had been two weeks later, there just would have been a skeleton there. So we're still on the evolutionary journey. Mammals are, they're, I would say, the most recently evolved of the chordates, phylum chordata, class mammals. They're obviously different than birds. Birds have feathers, mammals have hair, birds lay eggs, mammals have mammary glands and feed their young milk. Warm-blooded, birds are warm-blooded. Uh, 
an increase in parental investment. That's really quite interesting. And it actually increases as the evolutionary journey of mammals increases, which we'll talk about briefly, and a well-developed brain, especially in the more highly developed uh, mammals. This is a bonobo and bonobo offspring. And it's, in a, it's, it's a mammal, but it's, in a, it's its own subclass, which of course we're in as well, placentals. Uh, so I guess the thing is, uh, remember there are marsupials and mars a, 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 a kangaroo will give birth to a baby kangaroo and the baby is the size of a bumblebee. And that baby will crawl into the, the pouch and attach itself to, I guess, a mammary gland and stay in that pouch for months. It's, it's just not very developed when that organism comes out. Uh, similarly with another subclass monotremes, which is the duckbill platypus, which is a mammal with a duckbill and lays eggs. Duckbill platypus lays eggs, it's a mammal. Placentals have long parental care, um, long time in the uterus, and then a long time of parental care afterwards, years, often years for primates uh, of parental care. And why is that? And the answer is for the truly long care organisms, it's a development of the brain case, the, lar the, the larger brain case. So there's a theme here of increasing brain case size over time, which can only get so large in the uterus before it, that child, that, that offspring has to be born or it wouldn't make it through the pelvic girdle. This is the primate family tree. The, so across the top, it's just interesting to see what the groups are. That's not all of the groups. Uh, and there is, uh, I got very interested in primates, you know, in winter when the, you need something to do. Uh, two or three years ago, and I made a, it's about five or six page, uh, I would say worksheet on primates, and it is at the Methow Naturalist website as a PDF. You can download it if you wanted to look at it and print it out and you just get oriented to these 350 uh, primates in the world that we barely know exist. So there are two main groups, simians and prosimians. Simian means ape, prosimian means before the ape. And so this group on the left, the lemurs, we've heard of them, we know how cute they are, where do they live? They all live on the island of Madagascar. Lorises and tarsiers, I think most are on Madagascar. In any case, the majority of the pro-simians, which have smaller brains than simians, simians again, it means the group, the ape, the monkeys and the apes. Smaller brain cases, most of them are from Madagascar. The interesting thing about Madagascar is it broke off of the African. I mentioned that uh, phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. The evolution of life reflects the evolutionary journey of the physical planet. Madagascar broke off of Africa. I forget how long ago. I mean, I could almost figure it out. Uh, Mammals, uh, primates. Primates are 80 million years old. The first primates appeared 80 million years ago. Monkeys, I'm just guessing 150 million years ago. I'll bet Madagascar broke off of Africa about 200 million years ago. And, and there was less competition. And so there was less diversification, less challenge to stay alive on this large, but small island compared to the larger continent of Africa. And so the prosimians went their own evolutionary journey and became lemurs and lorises and tarsiers. On the larger continent, there was more competition, more diversification, and we got old world monkeys and apes and humans. Um, so this is a, the smallest primate on the planet. It weighs one ounce. And this is probably what the first primates looked like. There are fossil primates. In fact, the earliest primate fossils are found in North America. And it does appear that primates probably first appeared in North America, and this is what they look like. Small in size, small brained. Uh, old world monkeys, it's the largest group of 
primates, 138 species. This was a mandrel. We're closely related to mandrels. You could have ended up looking like that, but we didn't. I'm sure that, that that's a male mandrel, and I'm sure that's all about sexual selection. The female mandrels just can't get over that turquoise blue nose. And are, you know, it's a way to communicate to the opposite sex and to other males the vitality of the male. That's what that color is all about. And it works for them. There are, yeah, there have been experiments where people have captured things like red-winged blackbirds and painted red wings on juvenile blackbirds and the ju and the and those juvenile blackbirds i mean they're a year old but they're young immediately take over the swamp <laughs> it's all programmed these are very interesting new world monkeys capuchins in brazil and what's interesting about them is they show intelligence they show the capacity to a little bit of abstraction i would say of knowing that they can use rocks to break these palm nuts, which have a very hard shell, very nutritious inside, but very hard to crack. And they not only use rocks, but they'll pick up different rocks for different jobs, for, for maybe finishing a nut that's already cracked, they go get a smaller. So they're manipulating their environment and using tools to survive and to achieve their ends, but they don't manipulate the tool. They don't shape the tool. That was left for the human line to, think, to begin to develop. This is a bonobo doing yoga. So I guess we're moving into the family hominidae, seven species. You know, I think there's actually eight species now. There was a new orangutan found in Indonesia in the last 10 years. And I should have changed that to eight, but I forgot about it. But Great, so this is uh, the great apes. It's our, I forget actually, is it our family? Yeah, it's our family. This Homo sapiens is included in this. So the primary features are uh, an increasingly large brain size relative to the size of the body and long time in the uterus and high level of parental care in this family. There's an evolutionary line that has been unearthed over time. This is an extinct hominid, Australopithecus afarensis, that had a small brain. That's the same size, 400 cubic centimeters, 420 cubic centimeters, same size as a chimpanzee. But they can tell from the fossils that it had an upright stance. And it shows a graph, a, a picture there of the different arrangement of the femur, can't tell a lot from it, but the way that they pictured it there, you can tell that Lucy has an upright stance and walked on two limbs, on two feet. So the paleontologists like to say that the human line stood up before it got smart because the brain had not enlarged at this time. So Lucy, Lucy is the most complete Australopithecus afarensis ever found and famous, you know, uh, found in 1974 by Donald Johansson. And he likes to say they found 80% of the fossil, but they actually only found 20%. Because it's, if they find one humerus, then they just double it because they figure the other humerus look the same. <laughs> Anyhow, they got a lot of information from that creature. So this was in the email that many of you got, the Makapanska pebble. This pebble was found in a cave in South Africa that had fossil afferens uh, Australopithecus afarensis bones in it. They know it was populated by Australopithecus. The, the pebble was out of place. There were no other pebble rocks of this type. They could tell where it came from, you know, a couple miles away. It had clearly been picked up and brought into the cave. They also studied the rock and, and found that it was not manipulated by a living creature. Those are natural indentations, but it does look like a hominid type face. And the thinking is that it's probably the first evidence of abstract thought in the hominid line. And what that means is of course, that in the head of that creature, it came up with a concept that this looked like its own species and it brought it to show it to others in the cave. Now we don't know that for sure, but abstract thought did arise. We, don't, we know that because we spend all of our time 
in our heads. <laughs> so this could well be a true story. More of the evolutionary line, the first uh, creature that uh, attains the rank of Homo, our own uh, genus is Homo habilis. Habilis means handy. Uh, definitely worked tools. Homo habilis worked tools. So the, the brain size is increasing. We were at 420, now we're at 700 over a period of a million years from Australopithecus to Homo habilis is not much more than a million years. So it's considered to be evolutionarily very rapid change, very rapid growth in the size of the brain. And it allows this, for some reason, this process of conceptualization of thinking about the world and therefore manipulating the world to its own interest. And what I mean by that at the moment is making tools. They made tools, uh, but they were pretty crude tools. And I have maybe so soon and it shows how tools advanced over time. The next creature is Homo erectus. And roughly speaking, I mean, there may be some other Homo species, arguably in the line, but Homo erectus is the next popular one, which appeared 1.8 billion years ago. But look at the size of the brain. It's up to 1,200 cubic centimeters. Ours is 1,300 cubic centimeters. Homo erectus had a brain size almost as large as ours. And that was reflected in their tool use. Their tools were much more sophisticated. Homo, there's smoke in that picture, the little fire over on the left. There's evidence that Homo erectus had learned to use fire. There's a great book called Catching Fire. I highly recommend it by Richard, I forget, Waltham, Richard, something with a W. But it's about the, this, this hominoid line capturing fire, learning how to use fire. And what was the advantage of fire? Multiple advantages. You could have fire in the dark. These, these, these uh, hominids are, are helpless. They have no sharp teeth. They have no claws. They have no hair on their body to speak of. They're in Africa and all the big cats are present in Africa. And they're, at night, they're completely vulnerable and fire keeps the big cats away. So fire made these, these organisms safe at night. And they also probably Homo habilis was by that time scavenging meat. It's not thought necessary that Homo habilis, the previous species, could, could kill meat, but it could certainly, it could pick up a branch and scare, scare lions away from a kill and, and go after it. If they could cook the meat, you can get twice the nutrients out of, out of meat that you can get out of raw meat. Well, Homo erectus figured out how to cook meat. And, this, and so the thing about the brain, the human brain is 4% of the biomass of the body and uses 20% of the energy. It uses a huge amount of, of energy. Where's that energy going to come from? The answer is probably from cooked food, which makes more of the nutrients in the food available than raw food. This shows the increase in brain size over time, not over time so much, but by organisms, chimpanzees have 400, Australopithecus, Habilis, Erectus, Neanderthals, bottom left, Homo sapiens, bottom right. Neanderthals had slightly larger brains. Embarrassingly enough, we may be on a, a downhill slide, you know. <laughs> Better cook your food a little more. <laughs> uh, generally, they did have slightly larger brain cases and they were plenty intelligent. The Neanderthals were plenty, plenty intelligent. This is an interesting um, graphic that shows the number of strikes necessary to make the tools that these different uh, homo species made. So the first one's not labeled, but I presume it's Homo erectus. Second one's on top says early Homo erectus, late Homo erectus, bottom left, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnons, which are Homo sapiens, our species, Cro-Magnons. Uh, those are the number of strikes. The, the, the thing, what's represented in the number of strikes is how far into the future your brain would allow you to imagine, how far into the future you could think so Cro-Magnons had to picture, before they started working a stone, they had to picture hundreds of strikes and the kind of tool that they wanted when they were done, and then proceed with those delicate strikes to create these much more highly refined tools than any of the other organisms, including the Neanderthals, who still were multiple strikes and, and sophisticated tools, 
what they say about Neanderthals is the Neanderthals were on the planet for, I would say 400,000 years, their tools never changed. They didn't seem to have the ability to uh, be creative beyond this initial, original, or initial spurt of tool making. And they were replaced. They, I forget, I don't think I have a picture here, but the Neanderthals probably evolved out of Africa, probably from Homo, uh, Homo erectus. I do have a picture here of Homo erectus out of Africa. So Homo erectus evolved in Africa. Homo erectus is the one that uh, first used fire, somewhat more sophisticated tools, increasing brain size. And they, the first, there's no Homo habilis, for instance, there's no Australopithecus ever found out of Africa. Homo erectus everywhere, including Europe. And it is thought that probably the Neanderthals evolved from Homo erectus after they were out of Africa. And then a new wave came out of Africa much later of our species. And our species replaced Neanderthals, probably killed them, and Homo erectus. The, the, the latest, the most recent Homo erectus fossils are only, can't remember, 100%, but in the area of China, 50,000 years old, 50,000 years old. Homo sapiens came out of Africa 70,000 years ago. So these species were mixing. And as you have read, we have Neanderthal genes. They say one, two to 5% Neanderthal genes in our genome. And they have been able to extract Neanderthal DNA from DNA bones. I don't know if they're fossils. They're probably not fossilized, they're bones. And um, map, map the Neanderthal genome and compare it to ours. And that's how they know that we share some of the same genes. This is just a concept of a Neanderthal. And I, it's actually a little joke I put in there. A Neanderthal man seeks woman with boat and motor. I probably should have taken that out, but there's this funny poster, you know, that says man seeks, there's a poster, man seeks a good woman who can cook so clean fish, and has a boat with a motor. Please send picture of boat and motor. <laughs> may not be funny to everyone, but it's a funny poster. And that's where I came up with that. Anyhow, Neanderthals were very creative. I mean, lived, they lived during the ice age in Europe when there were glaciers in Europe and they survived nicely to the end of the ice age, but then disappeared at the end of the ice age when Homo sapiens appeared in Europe. The last Neanderthal died about only about 25,000 years ago in Spain. So these are uh, uh, artifacts found in a cave in South Africa from Homo sapiens, 75,000 years old. And our species, by the way, just for this moment of noting, Homo sapiens is considered to be 200,000 years old or somewhat older. So this is 75,000 years. Homo sapiens had been around for 100,000 years. The interesting thing is here, so those shells are beads. These are the first beads. And that scratching in that piece of ochre is one of the first pieces of artwork or record keeping. Both of these reflect abstract thought. Why do we wear beads. <laughs> there are no other animals that wear beads. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting phenomenon and it's hard to know what to make of it. And of course, we, we all are still very much this way, but it's, the, it's a sense of self and it's a, it's a way of expressing, of, of enhancing and expressing the, the sense of self that that organism has. Uh, and the point is there were no beads all through evolutionary journey. <laughs> And there were no scratching on rocks, but even by early hominids, by Homo, by Homo habilis and Homo erectus, the Homo sapiens got into this world of abstraction, which both you know, serves us well and is causing tremendous problems at this time, this ability to live in our heads and think about the world in our heads, however accurately or inaccurately. This is a map of Homo sapiens out of Africa, if it's from National Geographic, uh, but what it mostly shows is that it shows that in the center in Africa, it says 200,000 years. That's a rough estimate of when Homo sapiens evolved out of Africa. It says 70,000 to 50,000. This is 
probably a 15 year old map, but that information is still roughly accurate. We don't know for sure. I would say 70,000 Homo sapiens out of Africa and spread to Australia by 50,000 years ago and into Asia. And then interestingly, you know, making it, it was, a, it was not so easy. They spread across the face of the earth, obviously, but making it into North America was not so simple. It was augmented by the fact that there was a land bridge 20,000 years ago across the Bering Sea. There was no Bering Sea. The Bering Sea is shallow, a couple of hundred feet deep. And the water level was down 400 feet. The ocean levels were down 400 feet 20,000 years ago. There was a land bridge and humans walked across it and they boated. They boated as well. And that's a story we don't have time to go into, but it's a good story. You know, the settlement of the Americas, which is a very lively topic these days. This is more on the, uh, the imagination, the evolving imagination of Homo sapiens. This is a, a little statuette. It's not very big. I think it's about four inches called the Venus of Jorge Fels. I think it's the first, it's 40,000 years old, found in a cave in Germany. First representation of humanity ever found is the statuette of the Venus of Jorge Ho, 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 um, uh, 200 of these, roughly 200 of these type statues of fertility goddesses, they're considered to be, and it would seem likely to be accurate. Fertility goddesses have been found scattered around Europe and the Near East. Uh, but of course, their conceptual phenomenon, they're representing um, the mind of humanity contemplating existence and probably trying to, to impact uh, the insecurity, the insecure future by creating tokens that might influence gods real or imagined. And then a sli uh, slightly older from the same cave, this uh, bone, which was uh, ascertained to be a flute, first music. All of these things had to evolve over time with the increasing power of and energy of the human brain. You're familiar with the art on the walls in Europe and elsewhere. I looked it up, uh, 700 caves with art have been found in, I think, Europe, maybe into the Ukraine if that's Europe or not Europe. Uh, but what were these people doing? And so the people who studied this make the point that this was not decoration. This was not like the painting hanging on your wall in your house because they were a quarter mile to a half a mile into the cave with no light other than a burning torch. So they were magnificently accurate representations of the megafauna of the time. Horses, there's a rhino there. European rhinos are extinct, of course, because the humans killed them and ate them. But there was some abstract process going on in the mind <clears throat> that drew Homo sapiens into these caves to represent the animals that gave them their lives, that they hunted for food. So a big, a big threshold in the evolution, in a big history journey is the appearance of agriculture. So I said Homo sapiens is 200,000 years old. Agriculture is 10,000 years old. So for most of human history, our species has been hunter-gatherers. Agriculture ar arose about 10,000 years ago in the Near East. So over there on the left, you know, uh, on the Mediterranean, is the first signs of agriculture uh, in what is now Syria and Turkey and Palestine and Israel. But the really fascinating thing about agriculture is that it arose, apparently arose independently in at least four different locations on the planet at slightly different times or thousands of years apart, but with no known communication between the different cultures where agriculture had arisen. 
So we have agriculture arising in the Mediterranean 10,000 years ago. And in China, about 8,000 years ago, by the way, down there on Pau Pau, New Guinea, by Australia, they, they'll date that to 10,000 years, as old as, I mean, at least tentatively. Uh, and then in the Americas, it arose in Central America 5,000 years ago. But in fact, in, in South America, they were growing potatoes 10,000 years ago, the same as in the middle, same date as the Middle East. Well, humans had only arrived there no more than 14,000 years ago, certainly. So the interesting thing is agriculture or seems to have arisen independently because there was no communication between these groups. So is there some sort of pattern, not, not, not preordained, but predictable? Is there a predictable pattern for the evolutionary journey of humanity? And of course, why did agriculture arise? I think um, it's pretty clear that it arose because of an increasing human population and a decrease in prey, in animal prey and, and in food sources. And the natural occurrence that some plants that you're bringing home spring up the next year at your feet. If you bring home wild wheat and spill it, it's gonna come up in your village the next year. And it would be just a natural evolutionary journey to realize that you could take those seeds and plant them. So associated, associated with the rise of agriculture is the rise of settled communities, increasingly large communities, the first um, civilizations, you know, which might be maybe a city, this would be in Mesopotamia, interestingly enough, in Iraq, uh, of say 20,000, 50,000 people. What, but what arose then with large groups of people is a hierarchical structure which did not exist with the hunter-gatherers. And so these are just some uh, images I picked to represent this phenomenon of this hierarchy that arose as inevitably as agriculture, this hierarchy arose. And so let's see on the, uh, I think on the left, I think those are Mayans, top left, obviously Egyptians, top right, uh, Hindus in India, bottom left. And then um, that drawing on the bottom left is an excavation that's 2,800 years old of a hunter-gatherer burial in Siberia near the border of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I have the name. I don't know if I can find it, it doesn't matter the name too much. <clears throat> I can't find it at the moment. But it was, these are hunter gatherers. These were not agriculturalists, but it was a ceremonial gathering with uh, a, a male and a female buried in the middle, 160 horses buried in the um, little rooms made out of logs off to the side and a number of human sacrifices killed and buried at the same time. Then the whole thing was buried under a mound. So it, these people were obviously uh, high ranking people as a part of this probably nomadic horse tribe. And the point is that the hierarchy had arisen in this uh, hunter-gatherer society before agriculture arose. The biggest point here is this appearance of this phenomenon of hierarchy, which, you know, we are struggling with today in our society uh, with the power sources and the racism. It's, it's, it's a part of the human complex. This shows the increase in human energy consumption over time from calories at the bottom, primitive 2000. The human body needs about 2000 calories a day to survive. Hunter gatherers who I presume are utilizing fire, they aren't eating more. You can only eat 2000 calories a day, but they're utilizing more energy because they're now utilizing wood to heat their bodies uh, and energy from the environment as part of the life. So then there's early agriculture, advanced agriculture, and then our own society and what this shows is the tremendous 
increase in energy consumption over time on the human evolutionary journey, which fits with the themes. One of the themes of the big history group is an increase in complexity, which infers an increase in energy consumption. And this is a somewhat similar picture. This is the Industrial Revolution spreading out on the top left there, spreading out from England, they're burning, they're, you know, burning energy using hydropower and then coal and wood and then coal and eventually petroleum. The industrial revolution spread out. These machines are doing work. The machines are consuming energy. The amount of energy has increased exponentially. And so what this graph shows briefly, it's, it's a little hard for us to interpret because it shows that little orange dot over on the right. It's something called ERGS, E-R-G-S, ERGS. It's a tiny measure of energy, but it's per second per gram. So it's energy flow through an organism. And surprisingly, uh, on the graph itself, galaxies and stars are not energy dense because they are so massive. Yes, they have a lot of energy, but it, compared to the size of the, of the, of the uh, structure, the energy density is not that great. But energy density on the evolutionary journey has increased from plants, animals, brains. I mentioned how much. And modern society, that's our energy consumption from our external energy sources, not food, but fossil fuels, nuclear energy, hydropower. Uh, nothing like it has ever been seen on the planet before. <laughs> So we get into uh, a little bit of a, com a commentary on this process of abstraction. And it's, it has served us well, arguably, in that um, our lives are so much more comfortable and safe than they used to be. But in the process of imagining the world, of thinking, which is one step away from the physical world, we have created a world in our heads which does not always work that well. So these are the statues on Easter Island, the Moai on Easter Island. The Easter Islanders, as you may know, made eight, they made 800 of these. The largest one weighs 70,000 pounds and broke when they put it up. What were these things? And they, uh, they allegedly, it's argued, but likely they did cut down the forest. The forest disappeared. This was a forested island. Now there, there are no native trees on this island. There are some trees that have been imported in this later day and age but they lost their forest, they lost their soil. In the meantime, they erected 400 of these moai, others never got erected, and they, they lost the capacity to grow enough food for the growing population because of this belief system, whatever it was. It's thought to have been ancestor worship, but it was something obviously made up in the head that was disconnected from the ecosystem, disconnected from the ecology of the land, and I have a few other examples of that. I drew up, pulled up a picture, on the upper right, that is the Earth-centered um, universe, which is the way that humanity pictured the universe for a long time. The Earth is at the center. The sun is going around the Earth. And it's because we have this, you know, all organisms have to take care of the body they live in. They're all self-centered by degrees. Humanity has inherited that on the evolutionary journey. We, we do have to take care of our body. It created a false sense of the world, a self-centered sense of the world. Sun does not go around the earth. It looks like it does. It comes up in the west and goes down to the east, but it doesn't. And we're not the center of the universe. That's the bad news. And, you know, this goes on with some other examples. This is, this is Jesus in a tortilla. I think you, you've certainly heard of this phenomenon. And to tell you the truth, there, you know, this has come up a number of times, and this I think is, you know, kind of a, making a little joke of it. Somebody imprinted this really does look like Jesus in a tortilla, but Jesus has appeared, you know, in the toasting of a tortilla a number of times, and and these things get put in glass cases, and tens of thousands of people come to see this apparition of God. I just think it shows the power of the the, the process of abstraction, the world that we make up in our heads to um, our own detriment. It's not serving us well. What we need to understand is ecology, is how the ecology of the planet works and how we can fit into that. And that's 
we're largely not using it that, so I beg your forgiveness for the next picture. This is that girl in Vietnam with her skin burned from napalm. Her name is actually Kim Phuc. She's still alive today in Canada. But I'm just bringing up, in my mind, and this would be true for many of you, I was a child of the Vietnam War. I did not go to Vietnam, but it was raging in my youth. Now, those people were rice farmers. Uh, you know, they made $250 a year, <laughs> most of them. They lived in villages made out of grass, and we thought we had to go over and fight them. We had to go to 8,000 miles away and fight these people because of the power of the mind. And because it's, it's unmoored from reality, it's just unmoored from reality. Oh, I forget the last one. I'm afraid to pull it up here. Oh, yeah, nuclear weapons. Well, same story. You know, we, we feel protected by nuclear weapons, but obviously the opposite is the case. So I, I tried to summarize this phenomenon lightly, you know, because I don't want to turn this into any, I mean, everybody comes up with their own idea of how we deal. I think what's interesting is to see that we do have an abstract world within our heads, a world of thought, and it can't be completely trusted. We do need to question things. So this is just a cartoon. Don't believe everything you think. I forget what the other one is. Oh yeah, it's a good cartoon. So this guy's walking to the park and he's got his dog and the dog's happy and the guy isn't. And the reason is because the guy's head is just completely full of some abstract story that he's spinning about his problems and how he never got what he deserved and people don't admire him enough. And the dog sees the trees and the park and is happy <laughs> to live on the world. It's just, and so this, then I have a quote. I debated whether to put it in. This is something a friend said to me 40 years ago, in all honesty, when I lived down in 50 years ago, when I lived down in San Francisco. And I wrote it down and it's in my book of quotes. And it's powerful to me. I've shared it with my daughter and she likes it. It's worth everything to get your mind as a friend rather than a teaser and a tormentor. Don't need to go to Vietnam. Don't need to go to, you know, just plant your feet on the planet. 